Good morning. My name is Sheila Lamb, and I'm with the Virginia SBDC Network, a partnership program between the U.S. Small Business Administration, George Mason University, and local host institutions throughout Virginia. In addition to the advising, training, and business information that the local SBDC offices provide, we offer specialty programs, such as the International Business Development Program, or IBD. The IBD program works with established firms to enhance their global success. Our certified global business professionals provide confidential advising, training, and customized research to help companies mitigate risk, prioritize markets, identify financing, and grow export sales. The Virginia SBDC IBD program has helped hundreds of Virginia companies from a variety of industry sectors to enter markets around the world. Today's webinar, Trade Talk, Using Online Marketing to Build Global Sales, is presented by the Virginia SBDC Network IBD program. We are recording today's presentation, and it will be posted on our website, virginiasbdc.org. Everyone's microphone is muted, and the chat feature is turned off, but if you have questions during the presentation, you can type those into the Q&A box. We have also enabled the live transcript function, which you can show or hide via your own meeting controls. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce Chris Van Orden, Assistant Director of International Trade at the Virginia SBDC. Thank you so much, Sheila. I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Trade Talk, a monthly webinar series from Virginia SBDC's International Business Development Program. Uh, as Sheila mentioned, my name is Chris Van Orden, and I'm the Assistant Director of the IBD Program at the Virginia SBDC at George Mason University. The IBD program provides counseling, training, and research services to Virginia's small business community looking to explore global markets. Uh, so today, I'll be speaking with Justin Seibert, founder and president of Direct Online Marketing, about online marketing in the global marketplace. Thanks for joining us today, Justin. Hey, thanks, Chris. Really excited to be here. Yeah, really appreciate you taking the time and sharing your expertise. So, um, so as I mentioned today, we're going to be speaking about online marketing at the sort of global scale. Um, before we kind of dig into any of the particulars, I think it's always helpful to lay a little bit of groundwork and talk about some of the terms of art. Um, so can you share sort of a working definition of what we mean and maybe more importantly, what we don't mean when we're talking about online marketing? Yeah, tons of confusing jargon in our industry. Uh, so to keep it simple, when I'm talking today about online marketing or digital marketing, really just mean what are the ways that you can leverage the internet to grow your business? So uh, when you think of social media or Google, or uh, if we get into terms like search engine optimization or pay-per-click, all those things are different forms of digital marketing. Uh, sometimes people are going to use that term in interchangeably with e-commerce, while other people will use e-commerce meaning specifically purchases that are made directly on a website, uh, where you can put in a credit card and go through the whole process. Uh, for today, um, I'm hoping we can talk to your audience members that have both uh, those e-commerce functionalities on their website and those folks that are looking more for lead generation. And some of the things we'll talk about um, hopefully include uh, tips for both of them. And in some cases, it might be specific to either of those. Um, but yeah, that would be the working definition I would use. Yeah, that's great. It's it's important to get right. You don't want people talking past one another, um, you know, when, when you think you're thinking about one thing and right. Not every company is going to engage in e-commerce, right? The, in some sectors, it's just not possible to really be effective as an e-commerce retailer in an international context. But on, you know, sort of digital marketing being a thing that even if you don't know that you're always doing it, there's, there is an online presence out there. So it's important to get it right. So I guess that uh, leads me to a sort of another sort of kind of top line question here. What is a company missing out on if they're not actively engaged in digital marketing when they're selling internationally? Uh, short answer is a lot. Uh, but I would also say I'm I'm not a person that says it's right for every business. Mm -hmm. uh, you may be in a cycle where, you know, growth isn't an important thing for you. Um, you may be in an oligarchy kind of situation. Um, there's some companies that really want to fly under the radar and be the best kept secret. So again, not right for everybody. But for most of the rest of us, it offers a really huge opportunity. Um, the first part is really about visibility. So as an exporter, you have to realize that you need to be seen just to be in the game. Uh, and the only way to really be considered is to be found 
especially when people are searching for the products or services you sell. Uh, so we're big proponents of leveraging Google. And I'm going to say Google today uh, to talk about search engines in general, although there are some country specific ones that we bring up, like if you're interested in China or Korea. Um, but I also think people need to be paying attention to what's going on with AI. So Google's released, um, not to go too far in the weeds, but they made some major changes to the results they're showing people based on their AI. Uh, ChatGPT's uh, parent company has announced that Search GPT is coming out. I think that's going to be a game changer. Um, but again, search is really that first place where you're uh, making sure you're found when people are searching for what you offer um, because it's all about intent. So we know we're reaching people when they're most interested uh, they're doing the research. They want to find something to buy and they're just looking for the right partner for that. Yeah, that's good. And I, it is always heartening to hear somebody who works in this space. You know, it's not saying every single company needs to be doing these, right? You know, that's people have different goals in international markets. You know, there are some strategies that don't recommend this, but great. Given how broad of a category we're talking about here, when we're talking about digital marketing, you know, it's a, putting together the right strategy for that company in that specific market at that time, right? This is not just a plug and play solution here. Exactly. So, right. As I kind of mentioned before, you know, online marketing companies may not think that they're really doing much of that, but if you're doing social media marketing, if you have somebody posting things on social media, or if you just have a website in some way you're doing, you know, you're in that space. So a lot of companies are engaging in this domestically, even if they're not aware of it. When they're, a company decides to enter a, a new foreign market or maybe starts exporting for the first time, they may not know how things work differently. So speaking in kind of generalities here, we don't have to get into too many particulars unless they're illustrative. Um, what are some of the biggest differences that a potential exporter should keep in mind when they're talking about digital marketing domestically and in foreign markets? Yeah, I, so... It's an awesome question, and I want to talk about it from the perspective of um, starting with some things that will help you in both markets and then branching off into things that are specific there. Mm -hmm. where there's Because generally, best practices will help you in both areas, but then there's nuances that yeah. are important when you're talking about from an exporting perspective. So um, credibility is really critical to this, right? You know, the good news is, as I think all of you know, if you're exporting already, that you get credit for being an American company. In many countries, that's a positive. They trust your products a little bit more automatically as part of that. But it takes a lot of trust to buy something from someone you don't know, who's you've never met, and who's over an ocean away from you. So making sure you're boosting your credibility is really going to be critical uh, as part of this. So things like testimonials and case studies, again, a general uh, piece of advice. But if you can tailor those for those markets, especially to foreign clients, um, that's going to help. So if you're going to Sweden and you can talk about a case study, you can use a quote from a Swedish company that's Aces. Um, if you don't have that, but maybe you have some more uh, somebody that's a Nordic company that you can feature, at least a European company, then I'd make sure that you're using those. Um, you also want to make sure that on your website, it looks like you export. So are you talking about that? Are you talking about what you do from a customs perspective and are they going to pay for the fees? Or are you going to pay for the fees? Are you talking about how you can deliver containers? Uh, is there a dedicated page to this? Do you have a phone number with a plus one in front of it? That's not a toll free number. Those are all things that send those signals that yes, this is a company that does this on the regular. And it's somebody that probably has a track record I can trust. And then finally, I'd say really make uh, to think about what you want to do from a language perspective. And if, to keep it super high level, if you are e-commerce, and so uh, again, you're going to show products on your website, um, there's going to be a SKU number, there's going to be um, a picture of the product, there's going to be pricing, and we can talk about whether you change your currencies or not. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes plugins are good enough for that, right? Because people can see the picture. It's not going to be a perfect translation, although they're getting better all the time. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're a lead generation company, or, or that's what you're trying to do from a foreign perspective, that's probably not good enough. And you probably want to have some more professional translation as part of what you're doing. And again, happy to answer questions or go into, into the weeds more on that. But those are some of the things I would think about. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's um, helpful. And I, I, I like your point about, right. You know, this is getting into a concept of website localization, right? This is just your specific, you know, your website, 
how much are you tailoring it to that foreign market? And obviously e-commerce is one thing, right? When you're talking about actually doing transactions online and all of that, but it doesn't have to be a wholesale major rebuild of the website to be entirely tailored to that market. Just signaling through your website that you are open to foreign markets, that you have some presence there. Um, I've heard some people talking about having a landing page, you know, tied to make, depending on where the IP address is, or just having a welcome banner that pops up in the local language and say, we're happy to work with you. Things like that. Can you talk a little bit about some of those intermediate strategies to like signal to foreign, you know, it to foreign audiences that, Hey, we are an international company. We're not, you know, only focus on the American market, let's say. Yeah, definitely in the upper. Sorry, think, think about the, pro, uh, the the order that I want to mention this in. Sure. Uh, so first thing is, um, let's have in the upper corner of your site, if you're going to offer in different languages, have those languages up there. Um, couple tips on that. Don't use flags because there's multiple countries speaking those different languages. Um, and then have the language be that language in that language. So in other words, put Espanol and not Spanish um, mm -hmm. when you're writing that out so that people can toggle between those. I do like, Chris, what you mentioned in terms of having the website automatically kind of uh, uh, default mm -hmm. to the language of that region based on the IP address. Um, but it doesn't work 100% of the time for everybody as part of it. They may also have different languages they prefer to speak in. So having that toggle is still going to be really important as part of that. Um, so I think that's important. I would also, uh, in terms of that signaling, one of the things that I really, really like uh, when I see it for e-commerce companies is they can use a landing page like you're talking about where it's, hey, do you... Do you want to see our products? You can buy them right here. Like here's a link and it basically sends them off to the rest of the website. But if you're looking to buy in bulk or you have questions about shipping overseas, you know, fill out this form and we're going to contact you. Mm -hmm. So that way you can really nurture those for those people that are bigger uh, purchasers and are looking to make maybe a container full as a part, uh, as opposed to onesie twosies. Yeah. Uh, so I'm a big fan of, of doing that and just being out front with, Yes, we have experience in this and you can talk about all of your accolades and put all your credibility signals on that page. So um, having a dedicated page for that, even if you're not doing e-commerce, but just talks about here's how we export can be really powerful. Yeah, yeah. That that level of transparency, right? Say, yes, we do this. We're experienced in this. Um, even if you're not experienced, just saying, hey, we're, we want to work with you. We're, you know, and, and getting the conversation started, making it easy instead of having to go and find that contact us page and translate it and like, oh, I th do you happen to sell here, right? Those, I know that this is, no one's ever confused me for an online marketing expert or anything, but I know, right, the number of clicks to get to the right answer, right? You lose person with every click and how much digging are people willing to do before they move on? So just making it very easy for people to say, hey, I have the information that I need to know that it's worth taking the next step. Exactly. And uh, things that you can improve to exactly your point, don't ask for a ton of information. I mean, really, what's the minimal amount of information to put in there? So um, you want a contact name, you want some sort of contact information, a phone or an email address or both of those, and that's fine. Uh, maybe a company name uh, and then a, a questions box, right? So let them fill out what they're interested in when you start asking for a lot more information that every additional piece of information you ask for adds to the friction and makes it less likely the person's going to fill out the form to do that. Um, I'd also make it really easy for people to contact you in the way that they're most comfortable. Mm -hmm. So if you can put live chat, if you can put, um, you know, a, a, a phone number that they can reach out to and um, realize uh, even having a symbol for like WhatsApp uh, type mm -hmm. of thing. If you're able to do that, that's so popular in so many countries. Um, those again are just ways to make it easier. And again, for that credibility signal. No, that's like interesting. I, I haven't encountered that much, but I really like the idea. I know every time that I'm speaking with, you know, foreign partners, whoever it might be, WhatsApp is the preferred, you mm -hmm. know, communication and um, why, why not for a company that makes it easier, right? Not having to get the all the codes right and do their plans allow for international dialing that kind of thing 
Yeah. And I mean, you know, if you've been doing this for a long time. It's a few years ago was Skype uh, was, was the, what we'd put out there and everything else. I, I can't remember the last time I had a non spam thing come through Skype, but uh, everything feels like it's WhatsApp these days. Yeah. Yeah. And keeping current with that and knowing just, yeah, how people like to communicate. It doesn't take much to, to figure that out and make it a little bit easier for customers or partners to find you. Um, one point I wanted to raise and this is when you were talking about, right, having a page for everybody to make it, you know, clear, hey, if you're a foreign buyer, here's a site just so that you can make it clear. Um, I was looking at the hotels for some upcoming travel internationally, and they had a hotel XYZ dot IT for Italy, and then hotel XYZ dot EU for, you know, people from outside Italy, it was defaulted to English. It was somewhat oriented towards the European market in general, but it was clear that it was for people outside the country. And it just, the landing page looked different. Once you went down through, it looked the same, but it just made it very clear. Hey, we are, we are open to you or we want to make it easy because there's plenty of hotels that you have to use Google translate on the website and you never know if mm -hmm. it's quite correct mm -hmm. and all of those things. It's a simple signifier, but, um, it helped me to make that decision to use them instead of someone else. So yeah, exactly. it works. And, and it's, it's also really helpful from a, um, we may or may not get into this, but from a search engine optimization standpoint, how do you get Google and the other search engines to find you? They're doing something where they have that slash IT or that dot IT as mm -hmm. a way to signal to Google when somebody's searching in Italy on, on Google Italia, then they're getting those, uh, they're going to favor those companies that are specifically optimized for that, in addition to just being written in Italian. Um, and then having that other version that is more of the global version uh, for when people are searching in English. So it's a it's a smart play all around. Yeah. Well, that's that leads me very much to my next question, which is, right, you have a website, ideally, if you're tailoring it in even small ways to whoever you might be trying to reach, right? This is the, the most um, kind of prominent uh, presence that you're going to have online in former is your own website, right? Of course, people need to be able to find it. Um, your doesn't matter how good your website is if no one ever visits it. So search engine optimization is really important, right? If somebody wants to find you, if you're a supplier, if you're, you know, going to be selling them something, you want to be on that first page where they're going to find you. So how can American companies develop an SEO strategy to reach consumers in foreign markets outside of the u.s yeah uh one of my favorite subjects so thank you for bringing it up there um first you need to have a solid seo strategy in general so let me just take a minute on that and we'll get more to foreign optimization um so if you think about google a giant formula they call it an algorithm so they sound smart um hundreds of variables they change those thousands of times during the year now, they're always making little tweaks. Sometimes they make big changes, but at the end of the day, what they're looking for is, are you giving good information that people will find valuable that answers their question? And then will the people spend a lot of time on the website? Yes, they're tracking how long you're spending there and that's feeding back into their, into their engines. Um, I think it's helpful to think of those signals, those thousands of signals um, in a couple of different areas. One, I think of as authority. So that's what you're talking about on your website. So that's your content. It's also how quickly does the site load? Is it a good user experience? Can people find what they're looking for? Are there broken links? All of those things that you have total control over. Um, and that's a lot of it. That's a lot of what you will do from an SEO perspective to help your site become more visible. But if that was all just totally what you could control, then it'd be a lot easier to game the system. So Google is looking for outside factors that will also impact your rankings. And so it's going to look at things, how people are talking about you on other websites, and especially if they're linking to you. So if the New York Times published an article about you, that's great. And if there's a link that somebody can click on from uh, nytimes.com to come over to your site, even better as part of it. So they're looking for those credibility signals. So with that said, that's what we want to do for all forms of search engine optimization. And then we think about what are we going to do specifically for foreign markets? Um, the first thing we need to think about is, do we have a separate website dedicated for that market and for that language? So I like to think about a specific country or language. It, it, maybe even start there for a second, because mm -hmm. are you trying to reach all of Latin America or are you trying to reach 
Peru or because that's going to impact what your strategy is going to look like. Mm. And if you say, let's just for these purposes say that we're, we're going after um, uh, uh, Romania and so dot RO, we can either have a separate website for our company. So that would be in my case, companies direct OM.com. So that would be direct OM.RO or we can do a separate subdomain and I apologize if it's getting in the weeds, but it's an important. No, this, is great. This, is, this is what we need to know. Okay. Th then a subdomain is ro.directom.com and then a subdirectory is directom.com slash ro. And so there's pros and cons to each of those. I would say that Unless a market is really important, you're experienced, you're really targeting, you're doing a ton, I would not do a full separate website. So that directom.ro or .com.ro, I would avoid that because it's just creating so much extra effort on your part to maintain a separate website. I think it's overkill. Generally speaking, but happy to answer questions, give feedback to people's specific um, uh, uh, cases. So then you're really left with, do you want to do that subdomain or that subdirectory as part of it? And it used to be from a foreign perspective that subdomain was definitely the better way to go in most cases. Google's getting a little bit better at understanding it so that that subdirectory can work as well. The mm -hmm. subdomain is nice and it's a little bit easier generally for your people that manage your website that if they want to have it have a different structure, maybe there's not as many pages as your main website, maybe it's a different menu, um, a totally different look, that's a little bit easier to do on that subdomain. On that subdirectory, it's just easier to manage. Um, so if you're just basically, it's going to be a separate folder on your website. It's going to have the same navigation. It's going to do those types of things. It's just going to be translated. Um, although you can also do slash RO dash EN and slash RO dash RO um, to, to signal the language as part of it. Figure on one of those, whichever one you want to do. And then you can also use Google Search Console. So that's a free tool they put out there. It used to be called Google Webmaster Tools, if you ever heard of that. Um, and then you can submit to them that that subdomain or that subdirectory is specifically for that market that you're trying to reach in that language that you're trying to reach. Um, the last super weedy thing I'll mention, uh, there's a tag that you can have your webmaster put on those pages called an href lang tag. I don't know why it's so ugly, but href lang. And that href lang tag is another way to tell the search engines that this page is about this language or this market. So um, putting that in there can be another signal to help your SEO in that market. And then finally, if you can build links, so we talked about those earlier, if you have a link on another website that links back to you, if you can get those links from a site in that local market that has a bigger weight on your SEO for that. So if you have a distributor there or maybe clients you've worked with or you're sponsoring something or all the other ways that you might build a link through a uh, press release or a, an article in a, in a local media source, all those things can help your SEO in the local market too. Okay. Those are, yeah, those are really helpful. And it's nice that those are all attainable, right? You know, if it's submitting a file to Google, if it's, you know, whoever your web developer is to add a tag, a tag, which doesn't sound like it's overly complicated if you know what you're doing, those are achievable steps. We're not talking about you know, retooling an entire website just to make it work, right? That's that's That might make sense in specific situations, but the market probably is more developed at that point or it might be represent a pretty significant share of a company's overall revenue to justify a whole retool. Yeah, I, I think that's right. And, you know, you get into, is the, you know, the, the phrase we all use is the uh, juice worth the squeeze. Mm -hmm. Like, Yes, every market in Latam, they all speak a different Spanish. I mean, putting aside mm -hmm. Brazil and 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 the other ones. Uh, so you might have a different word for tires that's used in each market. But even if you don't have something that extreme, they speak Spanish a little bit differently. They write Spanish a little bit differently. And if those markets are all really, really important to you, great. Take the time to localize to those markets. Take the time to have a separate subdomain or subdirectory to each of those markets. But if you're starting off, that's just adding to your degree of difficulty and your bandwidth and your time and everything else. Just have a Spanish version that you're optimizing towards LATAM. Pick whichever localized version you want to use and just make it the best one. And then over time, to your point, Chris, you can move on to 
then break out some specific markets from there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you see it with English language websites. Sometimes they have the, you know, British flag and then the American flag and it's subtle differences. Of course, if you're, again, if you're doing e-commerce and you're going to be doing things like shipping a product to somebody is going to have much more real world implications about, right, well, calculating shipping costs and are certain things prohibited or not, right? That's a whole different thing. But just on the basics of a website, right, is it, are we talking about British spelling or American spelling? Because just that is a signal like, hey, I, I want to sell to you, you know, England. I'm, we are we are looking at you specifically. And it's nice. People like that. But, you know, for a, if there's a Spanish company that does not want to specify just yet, they might just choose one or the other and run with it. That makes sense. Um, so that's right. Just a little bit about sort of the SEO and the what your own website, things like that, right? This is making yourself findable, that kind of thing, right? People are looking for your product or service, making it so that they can find you, make that decision to buy from you. That's a great situation. If a company wants to be more active, right? And actually go out and more actively seek international customers online, they're probably going to start thinking about advertising, right? What are some sort of strategies and tools that American companies have when they're thinking about advertising internationally for the first time? Yeah, I, the good news is if you're already doing something like Google Ads, it's a great way to to hit those other Cs. And there's ways you can do your marketing a little bit differently, your advertising a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. But um, that's kind of that flip side of SEO is doing that paid search. And it's a lot faster where SEO is going to take you a few months uh, up to six months or more to really get the full benefit of it. Paid search, pay-per-click, let's use them interchangeably, Google ads, they're going to allow you to pe to reach people immediately. So as soon as you put up an ad, you put up your budget and everything else, your ads show immediately. Um, if the, there are a few markets, as I mentioned, where Google is not the number one player, uh, but in most of those markets, you can still get coverage by advertising on Google ads. Mm -hmm. So you can get into Korea because of relationships that Daum has with Google ads. You can get uh, a lot of people in Japan, even though it's not the number one search engine, a lot of people in Japan still use Google. A lot of people in Russia and their satellite countries still use Google, even though Yandex is number one. The, num uh, the, the one difference is <laughs> mainland China. So if you want to reach people in China, uh, the Great Firewall blocks them off completely. Uh, so you're not going to reach people with Google. Uh, so you have to use one of their local search engines like Baidu or, or Shenmar 360. If you want to use those, um, you can't do that from here on your own. So like Google Ads, you can set up, you, you can use those. Even if you want to use Yandex, you can set up a Yandex account. But to get Baidu you have to work with somebody who lives in or has a, a, a presence established in mainland China. So you want to work with an agency that has that or an agency that has relationships on that front or a distributor or somebody. But otherwise, most of these places you can get with Google. Um, I think the other thing that people look at the most is really going to be on the social side of things. Mm -hmm. So uh, just keep in mind, I, I know everybody loves social and it feels it's free and everything else, but social's hard, right? Mm -hmm. And so- let's assume you're already doing great on social. If you're going to do social in another market, even if it's just advertising, it helps to have that presence on the marketing side of things. So if they click on their ad, they want to check you out and what you're doing on Facebook, on Instagram, on LinkedIn, some of those areas. Uh, so then you have to have a separate feed because it's tough to mix messages and languages on your main feed. So you probably want to have a separate page specifically for that market or for that language. So you're just, again, adding to the complexity on that front. But they're great ways to reach people. They're also great tools just to see what your audience looks like. So a lot of times we're recommending to people, do the research, tell Meta, tell LinkedIn what you're looking for in terms of the demographics or the professional information of you're trying to reach. And they'll come back and give you an estimate of how many people to reach. And if it looks good, you can start running campaigns just to try to generate some leads. Maybe uh, you're generating leads ahead of a, a site visit or a trade mission or something along those lines. They can be really popular. So social's great, but understand the complexities that come with that. And then if you really want to up your degree of difficulty, then you could look at um, some foreign social media platforms. If you look at, I can never pronounce it correctly, the Contacte from Russia, it's very mm -hmm. similar to Facebook, uh, 
I'm not going to say a blatant ripoff, uh, but looks very similar, functions very similarly to that. You can get into that, but you probably want to have somebody local that can advise you on it and write those posts. And then finally, I would also, if you are doing e-commerce, look at foreign marketplaces. Um, so Mercado Libre, for example, in LATAM, um, where Amazon struggles in that market a little bit, um, besides people shipping to Miami and then those third parties then taking it down to you. Um, Mercado Libre can be a great way to reach people uh, in those markets. Yeah. Well, all right. I wanted to circle back on a couple of things here. You, you, we, you covered a lot of ground there. That was great. Um, yes. I, I think it's interesting uh, hearing about, right, just uh, trying to reach mainland China and how difficult that is. Obviously, I, you know, we when we're working with companies, we want to make sure that they're aware of everything that's involved in going to China or some of these markets that might be more difficult. Just make sure, like you said, that like, it's a huge market. Is it all addressable? Who's to say, right? Making sure that you're aware of all of the contingencies and things like, you know, regulatory environment, those kinds of things, tariffs, making sure you have a viable market there before you invest and sign on with somebody, especially if you have IP, right? There's there's all kinds of things that go into this beyond just the sort of like the digital marketing side. So if this really is the right market for you, then knowing that, hey, to to reach Chinese consumers, you're going to have to go through this, right? Like, great. And that's, that might be the right decision for some companies, but um, there are other markets that are probably easier to reach customers in. And this is just a very real tangible way that you mentioned it there. Um, then talking about the social media side, right? And you said like the difficulty of reaching people in that market, having to have a whole parallel, um, you know, presence on these different social media platforms, whether it's something that's present, present in the US or something that's not. It sounds like there might sometimes be, uh, it might be more effective to leverage a partner there, whether that's a distributor and just giving them the content to be able to reach consumers there. If it's right, if they have a really strong following, if you're in a retail product or something like that, maybe they might be able to do it or, you know, affiliate marketing or things like that, where you can have somebody who has an audience already that aligns with yours and just giving them the tools to act on your behalf rather than you trying to build an audience in Romania, which I don't, I wouldn't know how to get Instagram followers in Romania currently. I don't know. Maybe if I, if I needed to, I could, but yeah. Do you want to talk, do you have any kind of thoughts on the sort of um, kind of developing the tools for other people to support your digital marketing efforts in those, uh, especially in social contexts, things like that? Yeah. I mean, so Awesome points. Totally agree on everything you said about China, by the way. It feels like it's a big opportunity. It is, but there's a lot of challenges that come along with it. Um, on the social front, so we typically would say, hey, you might want to work with a local agency or somebody that can do that, that knows the language, that knows the culture. Um, you know, we're exporters too. We work with companies in 25 different countries. And um, sometimes we help them in their own markets. Like there's a Mexican grocery store chain that we help in Mexico. There are um, med clinics in Europe. We help them just Europe, Hong Kong University. We help them just in Hong Kong. But typically we're helping them in other markets. And in none of those cases are we running like social media uh, marketing for them. It's just, it's, it's not where our strong suit is going to be. It's not where our value proposition is going to be. And likewise, we wouldn't offer it. And I would not recommend anybody that unless you have employees in that market or a local distributor that's going to do it for you or something along those lines, I think to take on in your own is going to be really difficult. So I would recommend farming that out. Um, if you're looking for quick hitters, though, sometimes it still can you can still run a a, a campaign. Um, there is a, a client of ours that I remember he was uh, a head of um, I forget what year it was, but Trade Winds when it was in um, South Africa, and he had several mission stops. Uh, I think like Ethiopia and Kenya and a, a couple of different countries. And so he ran a Facebook campaign. This wasn't mm. too long ago, maybe six years ago. And I think he generated something like eight leads, mm. six of which were good and four of which he ended up having meetings with for a total of less than $10. Um, and he, he took those leads, he turned them over to the U.S. Commercial Service and said, would you all vet these just to make sure they're worth um, us meeting with. Um, and so he did that just as kind of a test and he didn't go back and create a separate platform and, and everything else, uh, uh, or a separate page, I should say, 
that he was going to target this country. So it can be worthwhile from a quick hitter to see if it works. Now, I'll put the caveat, he tried the same thing in Japan, fell completely flat. Mm -hmm. um, but for ongoing success, I think, again, you're going to want to look to have that that full-blown page. Yeah. Well, I think I think that's a really interesting point, too, about, right, this marketing isn't necessarily just the long-term, you know, ongoing sales type of strategy. It could be oriented towards a specific push, whether it's a market visit and if it's just trying to generate these. I mean, not everybody's in a, you know, a consumer product space where they're going to be trying to sell over and over again, right? You might be just trying to get visibility among big buyers and then, or even to find a distributor and you go and when you're going to, you know, you're going to be paying you know, a visit to that market or you have some market entry campaign. This is all in the service of that. And then after that, you adjust your strategy. So I think that's a really good point for people to keep in mind that, right, there's marketing isn't just the sort of ongoing maintenance thing, but it can be very specific towards some other event that's happening. That's really I don't know, an interesting point. I like it. Um, so, you know, we're talking about, right, some of the different investments that companies can make and, you know, all marketing requires investment. And uh, the nice part about the online marketing world is the relative ease of measuring performance, right? Whether if we're talking about e-commerce, right, directly related to sales, it's very easy to capture. But even things like impressions or you mentioned, somebody trying to get meetings when they're going to be visiting the market, right? I had eight leads, six were good, four resulted in meetings, two of them became partners. That's it's certainly on a $10 investment that's worthwhile, but there's very real tangible ways to measure performance in online context that might be harder in, you know, traditional media, right? Print ads you could talk about circulation, but that doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, how do you, how do you even know what resulted from that? So in this sort of global online marketing space, what are some of the analytics that companies have access to um, and how should they think about tracking performance? Yeah, it's why I fell in love with this type of marketing when I started doing it in 2001 is that, you know, the old maxim in marketing was half my advertising works, half doesn't, I just don't know which half. Um, and we could start to measure and see what actually was working or not working as part of it. So um, when I, left California where I was doing this work in 2006 and started this agency 18 years ago, I was just really fortunate that I had that background at a time where as crazy as it seems today, people were like, Hey, is the internet a real thing? Um, I was like, yes. And I can prove why it's a real thing and why it matters for businesses. So step one is making sure that you have great analytics. Um, and most companies are using Google analytics on their website. Um, some companies have Adobe or some other things. If you're running an app, uh, but typically most places are doing Google. Um, Google had a decent thing that everybody loved or at least liked well enough called uh, universal analytics that people used for over a decade. And then Google had to blow that up and put together something called GA4 um, that they forced everybody into about a year ago and caused mad chaos for those people involved in that. I bring that up in that depending on how savvy you all are in your marketing and your web folks and everything else. Sometimes people hit like the easy button that Google provided to switch over from universal analytics to GA4. Mm -hmm. And then they didn't get what they need out of it. So for example, Google might default to just giving you two or three months worth of data and then erasing everything afterwards, as opposed to you can expand it to 14 months and, and get longer as part of it. So I'd make sure that you, number one, have had your Google Analytics reviewed so that you're getting all of the data, all of the information that you need. You're able to track the engagement with the website. If you put a lot of thought and effort into that, amazing, congratulations, you're ahead of the curve. If you hadn't, you might wanna talk with somebody, get a review. Um, I don't do sales pitches, but if you ever want to have somebody take a look, we're happy to have somebody on our team give you some feedback just for free. Um, so start with that. That's a, like critical do not pass go piece of it. Um, that allows you to start measuring against the source. So was it that uh, they came in from an ad? Was it an email? Was it an affiliate link? What mm -hmm. are those different places that they could have filled out a form or made a purchase? You can track all of that. Um, you can also look at geographically, where do they come from? So, um, you just did a trade show. 
how many people are checking you out from that city or that country or that, that region within the country as part of it. So you can get a lot of that great information. Then um, hopefully that makes sense. Again, mm -hmm. this is my flag in the ground. If you don't hear anything else, please make sure you have great analytics on your website because uh, it won't track retroactively. If you don't have it configured, it's not going to tell you what happened before. It's only from that date forward. Mm -hmm. The second thing that is really, really important, if you are in a lead generation standpoint, kind of the default is that you're going to get data about what became a lead, but that's not necessarily what became a good lead. So that person that's filling out your form as some spam robot looks just the same as somebody that's a legitimate lead that has an interest that you close on a deal. So you probably ought to be using some sort of CRM tool, um, popular ones you might've heard of uh, like HubSpot or Salesforce, uh, where you can track those people through the stages of the funnel. You can say it's an invalid lead, it's not actually any good, or hey, it was worthwhile for us speaking, maybe we closed a deal or at least sent a proposal to. And I think it's really important, especially if you're doing advertising, that you track not just your cost per lead, which is very common, well, what's your cost per lead in each stage of the funnel? So um, people use different terms, but for example, what's your cost per marketing qualified lead? What's your cost per sales qualified lead? What's your cost per opportunity? What's your cost per proposal? Cost, cost uh, per sales one. You want to make sure you're tracking all of those things and marrying those data sources together. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, obviously this is like, we could have had a whole conversation just on this, right? Of the analytics of marketing, but it's important to make sure that we, you know, that people are aware of, right? This is, this stuff doesn't just like it happens, right? You know, you ideally you set it up, but you're making sure that you're getting return on investment here and you adjust your strategy so that, well, wait, why did things suddenly spike or dip? What do we do differently? Did, did the change that we made help or hurt? Do we need to adjust course or not? Um, and I, you know, ideally you, when you make an investment or you make a change, you see the benefits from it. And if not, then you adjust course. Um, we had a couple of questions come in here that uh, I want to just mention that uh, first one uh, hopefully is relatively easy to answer. Does the Facebook pixel give you the same data? Should be relatively easy to answer, but I'll, I'll keep <laughs> it as short as I can on that front. Um, you want to have that because it's going to track that data for you. And I believe that you're going to want to get data from all the different sources. What you'll find is that the the metadata, that you, the data from meta that you get, uh, the data that you would see from Google Analytics, and let's say you're running a Shopify website, all three are going to have different information that's going to attribute to each of those. And you want them to be in somewhat of a range. So if they're within a range, that's fine, because they're not going to match up. And that's okay. You They, they just aren't, uh, if you're a perfectionist, get over it. They're not going to match. But they should be within a relative range of each other as part of it. The reason they won't match is that they're they're measuring things in a different way. Um, meta sometimes will uh, overinflate the data. Not uh, it's probably the wrong way of classifying it. Um, meta will sometimes want to give credit to like, did the person visit your page or did they see your page at all, uh, type of thing, and then give credit for a sale or conversion or lead gen as part of that. And that's not wrong, but it's basically taking a hundred percent credit for that. Whereas maybe it should be just a partial credit. So Google Analytics will actually try to do some of the data modeling where it would give 17% credit to that as opposed to 100% credit. So yes, you should use the Facebook pixel. Yes, you should look at Facebook metrics, but don't use that in lieu of those other platforms that you can do. So hopefully hopefully that answered the question. Yeah, I think that's helpful. I mean, obviously there are you know, entire workforces behind these algorithms and the way they work. And you know, that's why you are an expert we wanted to get in front of people is that this stuff isn't easy always easy to understand but if the takeaway is right it's a useful tool just understanding how it works and that it is not a substitute that's that's very helpful to to know um there was another question that came in um asking for any kinds of resources um for information on website optim optimization um i'm thinking website optimization meaning optim seo um, would be the, the term here, right? Versus the sort of localization question. Um, same sources for optimizing pages here in the US and, and abroad, and then asking about, um, is that possible also for a social media page in addition to a website? 
Uh, so taking the first parts of that, mm -hmm. um, I, I think you need to, so there's courses you can take. Um, there, there's different places uh, that offer those. Um, keep in mind that everybody is going to have their own kind of slant on it. Everybody's going to have their own pitch, um, have their own biases. Also keep in mind that I think if you're going to, some people are like, Hey, I want a book. Okay. That's great. But that book was written two years ago and now some of it's kind of obsolete with part of it. So I'd recommend places that are updated regularly. I recommend blogs, um, as part of that, um, big fan of SEMrush. So they're, they're one source I would look at. Moz has kind of changed the way that they look at things, but uh, and, and their business model. But Moz still has some good information on them. Moz, um, uh, Semrush, by the way, also has a nice certification course that I think is good. Um, HubSpot has some good information on on their blog, and I think really try to talk super high level uh, about things in a way that you can understand it. Um, and then just on our website, so directom.com, we have a blog. We're updating every every two weeks usually and have some information. we usually, sometimes we have how to type things, but more often it's more strategically, what are the things that you need to know? And we try to talk at a high level to to somebody in a way that they can understand. Great. And then, I'm sorry, the second part of the question was was about social? Yes. Uh, I don't know of any resources to talk about social optimization. I'm sure there are, but... Um, Google ends up having different relationships and same with Bing and Yahoo and all the different places have different relationships with the social media where uh, sometimes they, they get access to the full fire hose and they update uh, and will include the latest results as part of that. Sometimes they don't. Um, and sometimes it'll be, you can see the information, but only if they're logged in. I, I would look at social optimization more of just how are you going to generate traffic and awareness and be interesting to people and followers and everything else and then use that to send it to your website google will indirectly track that they're going to see more people coming to your website they're going to give you more credit for that but i wouldn't um i wouldn't look at optimizing your social channels specifically for search i'm not sure if that's even what the question was other than um kind of a brand reputation standpoint where if somebody's searching for your company name, that that would be another place they, that you would show up. Yeah, I think that's great. And that comes down to securing IP type things and just making sure that if they're looking for you, that it is you they find, that there's not somebody else, right? Depending on the market, that can be more of a concern sometimes of just making sure that if somebody's trying to find you, that it is in fact you. Um, yeah. A um, couple of additional questions here, at least one that I'll... Uh, Pose now, and then I think that some of these others ones will be coming along um, in our the last few questions we have. Um, the website uh, that you mentioned for certification. That, uh, rush. S E M Rush. S E M Rush dot com. But yes, yes. So feel free to dig into that. And if anybody's looking for any expertise in these things, they can always contact the SBDC too. We have some people who um, can just steer you to some resources especially publicly available ones that are obviously um uh experts uh you know just people like justin who uh exist in specifically in this space and if you just want some foundational knowledge reach out to us you can always reach out to justin too if you want um to get in front of an expert um one other question that came in here what did you mean by send the data to google from social media accounts um I'm not sure the exact phrase I used, but what um, <laughs> I, I think if I was talking about it in that answer to the question, um, the last question uh, on social optimization, um, the data from social going into Google, Google doesn't have a direct um, pipeline with a lot of them. Like you'll see they have a deal right now with, um, I, I still want to call it Twitter, X, um, I think they struck a deal very recently with Reddit. Um, so some of those places are likely to be filled in, but you're not getting a lot of deep Facebook results as part of that because there's they're in mortal combat with each other and uh, they, don't, they don't share all the information directly. So that might have been it, um, what I was trying to get across if we were talking about it from the perspective of analytics and looking at data. 
Um, I'm just saying that they live in their own separate ecosystems and you should compare that data that you're getting from a social channel such as Facebook against the data that you get from Google Analytics on your website against um, if you are e-commerce at your own e-commerce uh, sales data through Shopify or Big Commerce or whatever you're using. Cool. Thank you. Um, so then uh, a question that was raised I, kind of leads me to the next one that I wanted to raise to you. Um, somebody asked about, do you recommend outsourcing SEO and online marketing when you're a small company strapped for time? And I think that, of course, some of this depends on, you know, how much, how important is this to your business? You know, how, what stage of growth are you at? Are you looking to grow? Are you looking to maintain? Um, and like, what are your goals here and what's your capacity? So, right. I'm thinking about it somewhat of both there's the goals and then there's the skills that need to be covered here. And a lot of the times, right, you know, online marketing kind of feels like it just happens, but there's expertise that goes into this. There's skills, whether it's you or somebody else, what are some of the sort of foundational skills that you think a company either needs to cultivate in-house or seek from others if they're going to be engaging in some degree of online marketing? Yeah, I'm, I, it's an awesome question. So um, from a skill set perspective, you need the following. Number one, strategy. So what, knowing this, right? And Again, a lot of great tools out there you can learn, um, but what's what's the program you're going to put together and how are you going to change that based on the results you're seeing? Um, you need analytics, so really looking at analysis of the data. You need a content specialist, somebody that can write great content, first and foremost, write great content, period, that a human will like. But then how do you optimize that content? So there's that executional piece of, I don't know if that's a word, execution piece of it as well, uh, where how do you actually manipulate things in a way that Google will understand? Um, some of that's from an on-page content perspective. Some of that's from a development perspective of changes to your website. So you need all of those different skill sets to be there. I can tell you from somebody that's managing an agency and that all in one person, usually it's going to be a collection of people that are going to be on your team that are going to do it. Now, being a small business, and small business can mean mom and pop, it can mean $50 million, you know, according to government classifications. Um, it depends on like, how quickly do you need results? How much bandwidth do you have to learn? There's there's great, you can spend as much time on it as you want. That's the benefit of doing it in-house. You're saving money on paying an outside agency, although you're gonna do it yourself or you're gonna pay somebody else on your team. Um, another benefit of doing it, if the benefit of doing an agency is you got people with expertise, there's backup, there's redundancy, they know what they're doing, this is what they eat and breathe, they're doing it for people across different locations. So any of those can work. Um, it's just a question of what's right for your business. If you're going to use an outside agency, just understand you're going to have a decent, uh, you are going to have a cost associated with that. Um, and it depends on what your budget would look like. Great. Sorry, I, I my connection went sideways there, but it sounds like you addressed the question well. I apologize for that. That's uh, um, just hazards of the online webinar stuff. But thank you for answering that question there, uh, Justin. And I, um, I'm sure that people appreciated it. Um, so uh, we are coming close to the end of our time here, uh, and I'll just talk about this briefly here. Um, right, every market is regulated differently. We're not going to get into all the specifics here. Are there any major differences that companies need to be aware of when it comes to compliance in the sort of online marketing space when they're getting outside of the U.S. for the first time? A big one that ever, that many people have heard of is GDPR um, hitting. It started with Europe. I mean, that's where it's based out of. Um, and then you started to see that get copied over into like California had their own act and then into other countries as well. So it's just a privacy act. Um, governs like your use of analytics, your use of cookies. So it's going to be harder to track some of that data. I'm not going to open up the whole cookie thing. That's going to be a long conversation that is not worth it for the time we have left. Um, but then you also see in some countries, some individual um, policies. So like Turkey A has a really strict one called KVKK. Um, and it, it, it is, you basically can't contact anybody unless they've specifically opted in to receive messages and what types of messages they're willing to contact you. So yeah, you'll want to know for the countries you're dealing with um, what those laws are. Yeah. And that's, you know, that kind of areas, if you can, you can always reach out to the uh, international team here at the SBDC, if you're just want to make sure you feel comfortable, especially in these markets that might have more onerous 
things, right? There are some markets that are kind of famous for being very protective and right in general, the EU now everybody's aware of, but if you're, if you're engaging this space, GDPR is just data privacy is taken very seriously there. Just make sure this is a, the nice part is it's so widespread. It's very visible and there are solutions for this now. It's not like you have to build this yourself, but you can't just assume that you're going to skate by. You really need to make sure you're protected. So, right. Just having a, a, some strategy before you go and start um, engaging in foreign markets. That's a good practice for everything, inclu including digital marketing. Um, so if a company right has limited resources, this question kind of arose and they kind of just want to get started, what's one area you'd recommend they invest in to start? I think if you're looking to go fast, I'd recommend Google Ads. So you can see what, what's working, what's not working, you get quick data. Uh, and again, I wouldn't recommend putting up an ad today. You want to put more thought into what you're doing, but you could literally have ads running this afternoon. Um, if you're looking to build for long-term value, SEO. And again, like we talked about, SEO is mostly free. If you can do it in-house, um, you know, just make sure again, you have those capabilities to be able to do so. Yeah, that's great. And again, I know we only just glanced on e-commerce since that's its own we could speak for an hour just about that, um, right? About doing the actual tra online transactions for foreign customers. But that's obviously a bigger lift just to make sure that you're compliant, that you're executing it the right way, that you're um, just handling things the way that you need to, and then being able to fulfill those orders, right? There's a whole strategy behind that. That's another conversation for another day. But um, before we wrap up, I just would love to kind of, kind of open this up to just ask if there's one thing that you wish that companies knew about digital marketing in global contexts that people either often get wrong or it's a blind spot for them, what would that be? Uh, one I mentioned uh, just quickly is it, even if you're doing e-commerce, um, make sure that you're also thinking about it from a lead gen perspective. Um, and so what are the ways you can make it easy for those people to order? And keep in mind that um, a lot of experienced e-commerce exporters will tell you those people, you don't get excited. They're buying a $5 part on your website. They're sometimes just doing test orders to see what your customer service is like and the quality and everything else. And they may turn into great leads for you. So have a great newsletter campaign as well that you can have those people follow up on. If you're doing a ton of sales, you're not going to do outreach to every single person, but that's a way you can try to bring some people into the fold. And then my second one, and I asked for one, but I'm gonna give you a bonus one, uh, is just follow up. Uh, it's incredibly important to follow up multiple, multiple times. So have a system where you can continue to do that, um, especially if you do trade missions like the Virginia SBC offers and, and brings to you. Um, it's not just magic. And they're not just gonna say, yes, I'm ready to order from you right now. Um, if that happens, great. But for the most part, you're gonna have to continue to follow up. And so you don't wanna waste your time, your money, your efforts, or, or the Virginia SBDC's efforts and just kind of going in there, seeing they're looking for success too. And that's going to require a lot of that follow-up on your end. Yeah, that's a great, a great point. I think that, you know, everybody's so concerned about the sort of being found, making that sale. Well, the then what of it all, right? It's everyone's loves to build, no one loves to maintain. And I think that the long-term success is about keeping that engagement up and whether it's repeat customers or growing your audience or even just for SEO purposes, keeping it right, keeping that going. Um, ideally, you're not you're not looking to enter new foreign markets for a one-off thing. We want to make sure that this is you know supporting you long term because there is an investment. Awesome. 100%. Well, Justin, this has been great. Really appreciate your time and expertise. Um, thank you all for joining uh, us today in this uh, latest edition of the Virginia SBDC's Trade Talk webinar series. Um, stay tuned for details on the next session. We're going to be um, talking about using free trade agreements. Um, I believe that date is September 4th. Uh, if that's correct, Sheila, you can correct September me. September 5th. You were close. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> At 11 a.m. Um, so uh, we'll be talking about leveraging free trade agreements, um, which will be a really interesting topic for folks. So please tune in. You'll be seeing uh, that posted online sh shortly. But uh for now, I'd just like to say thanks again to Justin Seibert uh, for his time and expertise. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate your time. Uh, love to connect with you. Great. Justin and Chris, thank you both very much. And thank everyone who attended today. Uh, you will receive an email with a link to the recording. 
If you would like to sign up for upcoming webinars, such as the one Chris just mentioned that will be posted soon, um, or if you would like to access recorded webinars, please visit virginiasbdc.org forward slash training. These resources are designed to be used in collaboration with your local SBDC advisors. You can sign up for a free and confidential session by emailing help at virginiasbdc.org or via our website. And we hope to see you all at our next session. Take care, everyone.